Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome to Lazy the Goodies Group Lesson number 13 and our historical tidbit for this uh, week is Gothic martial arts and Gothic warfare and we, we are sort of elaborating on the sort of, we've gone from considering the macro level social and uh, political implications of warfare in the Ostrogothic uh, period to looking at the more personal, like what individual soldiers did. And of course, um, according to Patrick Amory and various other um, writers on uh, the Ostrogothic period, and also I think the Visigothic period, um, the simple fact is that Gothic warfare practices seem not to have differed massively from uh, late Roman antique practices. So we need to look at the Roman army in late antiquity to see, to get some insights into how the Goths were doing things. And as such, for instance, we have an, a detail here from Trajan's column, which granted is the second century common era so it's a couple of centuries before late antiquity and before the gods um but it shows for instance roman shoulders roman soldiers rather with curved rectangular scuta which is their shields and they're using them in a formation known as a testudo which is a tortoise and it forms this sort, sort of fort that is like safe from missiles however roman soldiers that are fighting outside of the protection of this testudo are using oval shields and i think this is worth thinking about because if you think about it if you look at the way that their shields are overlapping interlocked you need a large number of well-trained well-disciplined soldiers in order to um make this effective um whereas the soldiers who are outside of that who are fighting individually they seem to be carrying oval shields and i think there is a um there's a reason why that's the case even back in uh, earlier times of the roman empire also note that the legionaries are wearing plate mail, which in late antiquity was a bit too expensive, so it, it they couldn't mass produce this plate mail, and it was replaced with chain mail, as we're talking about here. So the the main changes in arms and armour from the sort of classical Roman period to late antiquity is that plate armour was replaced with chain mail armour, longer sparta swords, which are about 80 to 100 centimetres in length, which previously had been used only by cavalry, these replaced the shorter gladii swords, which are about 60 to 80 centimetres in total length, and they started to be used by infantry also. Note also that the, the sort of ratios of the Roman army and the Gothic army changed in late antiquity. So um, it, as sort of Roman army was Germanized and employed more German mercenaries, including the Goths, um, there was a greater emphasis on cavalry as opposed to infantry. And lastly, shields went from being a rectangular and curved to ovular and flat, as we mentioned earlier. Here are some surviving Roman gladi. Um, it's quite, they're quite uh, pretty, quite interesting. Some interesting things to note: um, they don't, they're not like later medieval swords. They don't have, um, they don't have a cross guard, so they don't offer very much protection to the hand. And this is because this is a weapon that you're always using, sort of, with a shield. It's Although some Romans may well have carried them individually um, on the streets and such lot, um, they aren't sort of designed for individual one-on-one -on -one fighting to, so much. They're designed for sort of large-scale group fighting. And I mentioned this last week about the an alternative, the Roman army's adoption of the Sparta sword. Um, I've gone over this. Here is a surviving Sparta sword blade, and you can notice that it's, it's longer. You can also notice, interestingly, that it's... Um, it thickens a bit. There's a um, distal, sorry, lateral widening, and towards the end of the sword, it broadens out, which gives the um, the thinner end of the sword a more sort of effective cutting force. Which, if we remember from last week, that the Roman writer Vegetius says that the Romans notice the Romans um, prefer stabbing with their swords um, as opposed to cutting with them. The fact that in late antiquity, when you have more Germanics uh, fighting within the Roman army and as and fighting with the Roman army, and we get swords that are designed more like this, which are more capable of delivering effective cutting injuries, that tells us something about how the nature of martial arts were changing in in the transition from uh, the classical era of Rome to late antiquity. And these are the sorts of changes which may have been brought about by the inclusion of Goths and other Germanics in the Roman army, or they may have been changes that were already happening and, and the Goths adopted to, it's hard to say. Here we have some um, third century Roman chainmail armour and an interesting note about sort of 
reenactment uh, armor. It's a bit hard to see, but um, this chainmail armor is riveted. So if I understand this correctly, it's a process wherein um, there's there's some piece of metal that connects the... Um, if you imagine the individual rings, it's like a string that you loop in around itself. Um, there's a bit of metal that connects them. Um, and this kind of chainmail armor is by far the most common historically. The kind that you can normally get in reenactment stalls and all the rest of it is actually um, relatively rare historically and apparently it was used by some medieval Japanese um, so warriors, but um, historically is quite rare. So watch out for that in your reenactment market. If you want the really high quality, historically authentic chainmail, you have to pay a bit more. And here we have a surviving Roman shield from Dura Europos. It's the kind of square shield, but it um, there's a, an interesting thing we can take away from this is that um, this, so this could have been a parade shield, it's entirely possible um, but we have references in even in military campaigns such as Lactantius's description of the Roman civil war between that's a yes exactly riveted chainmail, avoid the buttered chainmail yeah so we can see even accounts of the um, Roman civil war between the Emperor Constantine and his rival Maxentius that um, people had painted shields and they went into battle with colourful decoration. So that might give us an idea of what the their shield would look like. Um, so let's now look more specifically at a warfare for the Ostrogoths. So under King Theodoric the Great, the Ostrogoths seem to have maintained a more Roman style of military, except with the obvious distinction that the military was now compro comprised largely of Goths. And there are frequent men references in Cassiodorus's Rarie, which are the sort of state papers of the Ostrogothic government, to these sort of military camps, uh, camp, campi, campos, which Patrick Amory suggests might have used the Gothic language as a cant. So it might have been that in the camps, the sort of military language was a, dis was a descendant of Gothic in some way. It could have been Latin as well, with a lot of Gothic words mixed in. We don't quite know. We, we obviously don't have any sort of records of this language. But he suggests that um, this language would have been quite different to um, to the sort of biblical Gothic that we learn because it's a sort of spoken vernacular and it's not really a literary language like um, biblical Gothic was in the time of the Ostrogothic Kingdom. And we have a few references to the persistence of this as a language associated with the military in the Ostrogothic Kingdom, notably, for instance, um, the Rome, many of the Ostrogothic um, royals such as Queen Amara Swintha are described as speaking three languages. Presumably these are Latin, Greek and Gothic. And also there is a Roman, curiously called Cyprian, who impresses King Theodoric by learning to speak Gothic himself and teaching it uh, to his children, which is really curious. He's one of the, I think he's the only um, person we have evidence of learning Gothic, or named at least, to have learned Gothic in the Ostrogothic Kingdom, although I'm sure many did for various reasons. However, so standing armies such as the one that King Theodoric brought into Italy, his Goths who then would rule Italy, although they were originally a Roman military organisation, they seem to have become associated with Gothicness under Theodoric's rule. And we had this quote um, last week in our uh, tidbit, De barbis qui volver in jure testari, saying that um, for the barbarians who certainly fight for the Republic, we give license of giving testimony, however they wish and they may, whether they shall be drawn up at home or in the camps. And this is from Theodoric's law code, and it's um, basically incorporating this barbarian Gothic military power into Roman law. So it's sort of attempting to Romanize the uh, military culture of the Ostrogoths. Um, and these, this is a design of a Roman camp granted from Greece, but Roman camps across the empire were quite uniform and chances are very good that the Ostrogoths would have simply um, imitated these um, camps, especially because, um, if you bear in mind, King Theodoric himself, um, who led military campaigns with the Ostrogoths um, earlier on in his years, he, um, he was raised as a hostage in Constantinople and therefore trained in Greco-Roman uh, culture and warfare. So, there's decent reason to believe that Ostrogothic military camps would have had a similar layout to this one. And I'm go we're going to do um, a lesson 
after we come back from our Christmas break on Recopolis, the only sort of city that was built by the Goths. Um, and it gives us a really interesting chance to see what architect, what they did when they had left their own devices in terms of building things. And there are some similarities with that city and how military camps like this one here were constructed. We can see here in this uh, sarcophagus, completely removed from the camps, what the sort of scene of a battle might have been like. And it's interesting to note here that this is a very like late Roman thing because most of the soldiers are in fact on horseback or have fallen from horseback. And this is granted from a Roman perspective. Um, so it shows the Goths in these with these really scraggly beards, uh, long hair, uh, sleeve, tunics, all the rest of this and they're just out of control essentially and they're also sometimes wearing these phrygian caps that are associated with barbarians whereas the romans are either clean shaven or they've got a very maintained greek stoic beard they're wearing um scale armor and all the rest of it and they're sort of in their military might trampling the um the goths but the very fact that they sort of felt the need to do such exaggerated depictions um did the goths actually use the phrygian cap very good question um, I do not have a good answer for that. Um, it's hard to say because there's very few, um, there's very few, um, artworks of the Ostrogoths depicting themselves and those who are depicting themselves are the sort of royals, so there's, they're of course not representative. I will try and get an answer to that question of whether the Goths used the Phrygian cap in later, um, lessons. Um, a couple of things also we can notice from earlier is the use of these oval shields, these are slightly longer swords, stuff like this. This is all very characteristic of late antique Roman and Gothic warfare because the distinction between Roman and Gothic styles of fighting seem to have blurred a bit. So lastly, um, as I mentioned earlier, Ada Brun von Hofmeier in 1960 proposes that the Italian and German styles of martial arts, you guys may know this is HEMA, that we witness in the 15th century uh, fight book corpus. She argues that these are actually descendants of styles of martial arts which ultimately began in antiquity. The Romans, following Regetius's edict, favoured weapons optimised for stabbing, and the Germanics, in the meantime, preferred weapons that were optimised more for cutting. Um, and we can see this reflected in the archaeology. Um, swords associated with Germanic-speaking groups, whether it be the Goths, the, the Gepids, the, the Norse, etc., they all have broader blades, or not all, but they generally have broader blades, um, sometimes even a dulled tip that they're more optimised for cutting and the Roman ones are more pointed, they've got a, a sort of diamond shape point optimised for stabbing into people. So there are some flaws in the logic um, but there might may well be something to it. And we will end here with, um, now granted not gothic, of, unless you accept the theory that the goths originally came from Sweden, but but this is a 6th century sword recently found in Sweden and it's quite representative of what swords would have looked like in the 6th century. So Ostrogothic swords would have looked very similar to this and if you go to major sort of museums of warfare such as the, um, the Walter Collection in London for instance, uh, the Wallace, sorry, the Wallace Collection in London, you can see swords like this. And that is it. So now we have finished our tidbit, we're going to go on to our um, teach to our Gothic lesson. Yay, language! Okay, so 13th lesson. So with, with this lesson we're introducing finally a new verb class and this is um, the second week uh, conjugation of verbs. So unlike the first week one, which is underscored by its use of yan for an infinitive ending, the second week one is well known for ending in on or on. And it's one of the co one of the commonest words in the language, frion, from which the word frions, meaning friend, comes. It can be found to belong to this second week group. And so here is our conjugation pattern for this. So frio is I love, frios is you love, frioth is he, she, it, they love. Frion is we love, frioth is you love, and then frion is they plural love. And we've got a word stock as well. So, at, and these, these are mostly sort of new week two verbs. So, atlathon is to call over, farinon to be happy, frion to love, quarvon to walk, galathon to invite, 
Miton to consider, Sphilon to tell, Werthon to value, Raton to travel, Dulth is a party, which is quite fun, and Unte is a conjunction, it means sort of because. So, with now that we've got all these words, can anyone typing in voice translate from me from Gothic into English? Ratozu land mean. Um, do you have you been given there here? No. So there, I'll just tell you is, is the conjunction meaning through. And if someone could type it out for me in chat, or I can do it myself, that would be most helpful. Anyone want to type the answer for me in chat, or just say it aloud? Go for it. Feel free. Um, Ratozu. Ratozu. Ver. Yes. Um, are you travelling? Good. Do you travel to my land? Through my um, land. Exactly, yes. Are you travelling through my country? Very well done. Um, second one. Um, huila fina huerto. Um, goodness. So you haven't got huila here in the, um, in the word stock, but huila is um, time, basically. So huila fina huerto. Who knows what that is? Your time worth? Sorry, are your time worth? Um, yeah. So um, it's worth work. Work, not quite. Um, goodness, workian is worth. worth. Yeah. So so it's related to the English word worth. So worthon is uh, to value. So huila thina a worthon. Uh, huila, thina are both sort of feminine um, accusatives and in singular, so that means that means that it's like a single time or hour. Thina is yours, and then werthor is you know it's like I worthy or I value it exactly. Um, good work, guys, and so you should do the rest of these on your own um, in your own time including the English to Gothic, because um, that's what we need, English to Gothic, to get us speaking and reviving this language. Um, but for now, let us look at the past of Freon, because we've, we've been doing the past tense now. And you might notice that the pattern sort of carries over. So we have Friotha is I loved. Friothes is you uh, singular loved. Friotha is um, you a uh, he, she, it, or they loved. Um, so I can hear somebody's um, something if they could read that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, Friodevum is we loved, Friodevum is you plural loved, and Friodevum is they loved. So a couple more words we have atles, which is every, huarias, which is which. Sums, which is some, mitons, which is idea, and then miton, which is idea, but this is um, the accusative form. And we have a couple of phrases which are very useful. So, daga huamech is every day or daily, and then hise nacht is uh, tonight. And his is quite a weird, uh, sorry, not weird, but it's rare kind of word. And Yoshi has just typed out the um, sentence in chat. Who can give me an answer for? You know what this means in English. And um, means was. And galathon, if we look back up at our word stock, galathon is to invite. So, yes, who can give me a? Who can give me a translation? Frions means was. All men, yeah, and all women are invited to be my friend. Close, yes. Where? So yes, close. So um, so every every so al kuma al kuina, every man and every woman, and then vani galathola is a sort of subordinate clause, and it means like. Wh who I invited, so the other is like invited, and then Frions means was is um was my friend, um so we we could rearrange the sentence and say Frions 
us finding our lafla and it would be a bit more sensible in English and it would be um pale not quite so it's um so it, it's every man and every woman exactly yes um what about the next one and um which is and so aqua is a river think of the word aqua if you don't know that in this i'm gonna help you <laughs> ignore me um I guess you can think of the word aqueous in English, you know, like watery. It's like a river. <laughs> um, and an is uh, just a pond, basically, or two up until etc. So an suma aqua rarava yachto aqua friova. Anyone? Anyone want to give me an answer? Don't be shy. I see someone typing an answer. This is very exciting. Yes. The tension is killing me. It's not. It's fine. <laughs> Just write an answer. Uh, um, and is up to or towards. And summa horatata yachto aqua friova. Yes, Yoshi has um gotten has gotten it, of course. Um, but if anyone wants to find out an answer, that would be great. Um. <laughs> yeah. So I wait till the hill is finished. Up. Yes. So um um I see why you thought horse for aqua pale, but um no, I think it's um ah gonna it might be a slightly it's a very similar word, huh? Ehwa, I think it's horse. Ehwa, that's it with an a i. That's it exactly. Yeah. Um, ehwa is horse. Um, aqua is river. Um. So it's like towards a river, Rathrava is uh, I travelled. Um Yah Voakwa, so Voakwa is accusative. So it's the thing that being exed. Um Yah Voakwa Priova and I loved the river. I enjoyed the river. Wonderful. Good work guys. And that is the end. You really should um do these exercises on your own. At basically at any time because I sort of I'm just here working all day. Um, if you're stuck in your own time later in the week doing your workbook exercises, you can like message me and I'm happy to walk through things with you. Um, but for the time being, let us finish reading at long last the first of our Hamanumaning, the, collo the uh, colloquy um, Leiden, say the, the Leiden conversation. And we have gone all the way to the very last one now, part that's it yeah part eight okay so can i'll read it out and can if anyone identifies any uh, cognates um shout them out in chat so maho means leave me born yachso me in tewa in tewa do grith gangan yach lektion herkanga in wato grava than a summon athan was Danuch quima yach i savan nimmado hehat. Yach afarivia. Danuch ran you and watograva quiman. So, um, has, can anyone identify or guess what any of these sentences or parts of the sentences mean? Perhaps maybe you recognize a word. Uh, Similar to English or a language you speak. Marco means is my boy. Very good. Any others? Give me bread. Ah, so give me board. In this case, it's, it's I see why you thought that. Um, in this case, it's give me literally give me the board. Um, give me like a um writing tablet. Yes, bread is slaves exactly. Yachsumme in Tewa the Great Gangan 
um, so uh, so um, the first sentence is Marco means given his word yeah so me and he was the great gang and I collect on fair gang so it is um, my boy give me the the board and some are going into an order in order to study um, and the, and I will go over the lesson. So the ferganga is literally sort of through go. So I will go through the lesson like I'm doing. In Watograva Vana Saman, um in and so Watograva is a bath or a sort of bathroom. In Watograva Vana Saman is uh together into the bathroom or the bathhouse. Athan was was is um However, um, I was. Banach quima yach isava nimbal hehat. Then I come and I sort of and I ask that I and I ask if I can take uh, the um, the linen, basically the fine linen. Um, oh no, sorry. Um, well, yeah, yeah, it's an I come and he asks that I bring. Uh, or take the linen, which is savan, alone from Latin, incidentally. Yach afar ivia, and then I went back. Vanochran, you went watograva quimans. Then I ran, you went watograva quimans. Now coming in to the bathhouse. So this is, it's it's a bit hard to identify specifically um, who is saying what, but essentially what's happening is. Um, it's a home education scene. Um, they sort of go over a lesson and then it's essentially bedtime. So the boy goes off and he has a bath and then he dries himself and then presumably afterwards goes to bed. So um, that is, that is your, that's, we have gone to the end of the first Colloway in the Helen Minelmet episode of Ossipiana, otherwise known as the Gaskerians. Um, we're going to have another one next week, um, neatly translated. And thank you guys so much for um, coming. If you have any questions I should have mentioned, feel free to um, point them out in voice. Um, or you can ask me later on, or you can ask in the comment section of the YouTube video. And until next time, thank you guys for watching and bye. <laughs>